glad to get the invitation to come to this institute, and uh, even more glad when I discovered that I could work it in from Trinity. It is a bit of a break for the South, as Dr. Van Goddingen has pointed out, and I'm not to go anywhere else down here, but uh, at least the South is not escaping altogether. And uh, my first visit to America, which was uh, back in 1960, I recall I visited this city to speak at Belhaven College, and uh, I have very happy memories of what a warm and gracious place it is. I'm delighted to be back again. I am to, uh, to speak on John's Gospel, so before I start, shall we bow our heads and ask God's direction. Dear Father, we're grateful to you for the wonder of your love and for the multitude of your mercies. We're grateful that from time to time we have the opportunity of gathering together as we do now, round your word. We're grateful for the way in which you take that word and apply it to our need and our circumstances. And we ask that this afternoon you will do just that. We pray that this portion of your word that we study together may come alive for us all, and that each one of us may be drawn a, a little closer to, to you, that each one of us may be able to serve you a little better because of our time of study today, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. <coughs> The Gospel of John is a, a very wonderful book. Uh, someone has said it's a, a pool in which uh, a child can play and an elephant can swim. It's, in a sense, very simple. A beginner in Greek who discovers that he is set to, uh, to translate John rather than Matthew or Mark or Luke to start off with counts himself fortunate. He's got something which is very simple. He can, he can get through that all right. On the other hand, uh, the most profound scholar, the saintliest saint, will scarcely feel that he's got to the bottom of it. Uh, the simplicity in this gospel is deceptive. It's the simplicity that goes with great profundity. And we will study this over and over and over and still find something new every time we turn to it. Well, this afternoon, <clears throat> our study is to be concerned with the prologue, the first 18 verses, which are all concerned in one way and another with the, the Word. The Word and God, the Word and creation, the Word and John Baptist, the Word incarnate, the excellent word. First then, in the first couple of verses, uh, the word and God. <clears throat> the section begins, as you will know, in the beginning was the word, and in this way, presents us with our first problem in uh, the study of the fourth gospel. What is the meaning of enarche? We translate it smoothly in the beginning, but uh, ake, besides meaning beginning, can mean something like first cause. <clears throat> the word has the idea of firstness about it, and here we generally take it as first in time, but it can be first in the sense of causality. And I think it was Archbishop William Temple who said that this might mean at the beginning of all things or at the base of the universe. Why that could fit in. Now, if this happened just here, we might very well spend a lot of time and effort trying to work out what is right, which of those two we should prefer. 
But as we go through this gospel, we find that this kind of thing happens again and again. Um, John keeps using words which could be used in more ways than one. A very well-known one comes in the third chapter, where he speaks of being born an open. Again, from above, you can make out quite a good case for either. Uh, there is no way that I know of, of determining which it is. And he does, say, he does this again and again. <coughs> and I, at any rate, have become convinced as a result of a study of this book that he does it deliberately. That's a kind of shorthand, so he's him saying the thing twice, if he can say a thing which can be taken two ways, and he means you to take it both ways. Um, uh, such, a, such a mark of John's style that I can interpret it no other way. And so what he's telling us is that the Logos, the Word, was first. He's saying more than that. He's saying that the Logos is right at the basis of everything. There is nothing that is independent of the Logos. And the Logos presents us with the further problem. Where you going, John? The more problems there are, we've got two in five words. Uh, let's <coughs> go back to the usage of Greek in general. Logos, we translate word, and rightly so. But <coughs> we should be clear that for the Greeks, the idea of word was a bit different from ours. With us, a word is a, a simply a, a syllable, a a group of syllables put together, a unit of speech, and we, we refer to what is spoken or what is written, and that's about it. But the Greeks distinguished <coughs> between what they called the logos prophoregos, the word going out, that's our use of the word, and the logos in the athetos, the, the word staying in. And a word which wasn't uttered at all, but just remained within the man's mind, was just as much a logos as the word that was uttered. Just for good measure, the Greeks also had a logos spermaticos, a seminal word, but we've got enough trouble with the, the two, so we will leave that one on one side, we just note for the sake of completeness that there is the Logos, the Romanicos among the Greeks. The Logos in the Athenos, the word staying within, uh, meant something very much like reason. It's this rationality that activates a man. Now and then, as they looked out on this universe, the philosophers thought, maybe there's a logos in this universe, just as there is a logos in my mind. Heraclitus, for instance, 6th century BC, spoke of the word as something that was very much like the world soul, you know, the, the principle of rationality that runs right through this tremendous universe in which we find ourselves. It wasn't everybody that cottoned on to that. As a matter of fact, uh, this is not at all surprising because Heraclitus is a terribly difficult citizen to understand. What he did mean by Logos, I am not quite certain, but he thought highly of it, that is clear. He used the word logos and fire and God uh, to mean pretty much the same thing. And how you can put those three into one is a trifle difficult to work out. But our concern is, is not <coughs> to get to the bottom of Heraclitus' thought, but simply to establish the fact that from a way back, the word logos was used among some, at any rate, of the Greek philosophers to indicate 
the principle of rationality that runs right through the universe. And this wasn't kept up by all. Plato, for instance, made very little use of it. But getting on towards the Christian era, the Stoics caught it up. And they made quite a bit of use of, uh, of the idea of the Logos and the Word as it runs through the universe. And that meant, I think, that when we come to the New Testament period, among the Greeks generally, Logos would be thought of as something pretty outstanding. I don't mean by that that the ordinary Greek in the street would understand quite well what Heraclitus or the Stoics meant by Logos. But he would know that Logos was a concept which the philosophers valued very highly. And the philosophers in those days were the equivalent of the scientists today. Uh, they didn't have any scientists separate from philosophers. And as a matter of fact, you have to come quite a long way down in history before there was a distinction. You know, in the time when our classical education in the English-speaking countries was developed, uh, there was the idea of mental and moral philosophy and natural philosophy, which is the equivalent of our science. So that just as today people look up to scientists even if they don't always understand them. So, in the first century, people looked up to the philosophers, even if they didn't always understand them. And they would have had a, a fairly hazy idea, I think, as to what the philosophers meant by Logos. But they would have been quite clear that for the philosophers, the Logos was really something, uh, some great principle or perhaps person, I weren't too sure on that, uh, that runs right the way through the universe and, and has a, a cosmic function. So for the Greeks, this would be important. But the Jews, it would also be important. The Jews would have looked at it very differently. Now, coming up to the New Testament time, we have a period when the Jews were taking very seriously the importance of keeping the commandments of God. These and those who thought with them developed a system of what they called putting a fence around the law. By this, they meant that it's so important that no command of God be broken, that the safest thing is not to come anywhere near it. Now, and if the, if the word of God laid down a boundary and said, you must not cross that line, the Pharisees put their own line inside it and said, you mustn't cross that one. Then if one day absent-mindedly they busted their own regulation, they're still well inside the divine one. And so they felt that in this way, they would be able to, to keep God's law perfectly. Well, among other things, they read in the Lord of God, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Well, they didn't want to be caught breaking that one. And so they put their heads around the law and they said, well, <clears throat> let's not speak the name of God ever. And if we don't use that name, then we'll never take it in vain. And so they didn't. Which presented an odd problem when they met together for worship and they were reading from Scripture and there was the name of God in the passage that they had to read. So, they got out of it by putting in a reverent periphrasis. They would perhaps say, the Lord, 
the Holy One, the Blessed One. But well, they still do. I once had a, a Jewish student among my students, Jewish Christian, and he decided to cut me off to a synagogue one Sabbath day so I could see how the, the Lord is worshipped in synagogue. And I was interested to discover that uh, they were reading from the Hebrew scriptures. They made no concession to the fact that so many of the Jews in that area didn't speak Hebrew. And when they came to the divine name, instead of making any attempt to, to pronounce it, they said, Adonai, Lord, and did it quite consistently. So it's a habit which has lasted right through centuries. But one of the things that they sometimes did, instead of saying the Lord or the Blessed One or the Holy One, was to say the word, perhaps the word of the Lord. And this happened quite often. Um, we find it recorded in what I call the Targum. As I've pointed out, the, the proper thing to do in a synagogue is to read the scripture in the original language. But after people ceased to speak Hebrew, uh, that presented a problem for the ordinary congregation. They still read it in Hebrew, but as a concession to the weakness of the flesh, they developed the habit of somebody giving a running translation. And somebody read the scripture in Hebrew, somebody else gave a running translation to Greek or Aramaic or wherever it was that the language that the people spoke. And when it came into Aramaic, uh, they used this word, word, memra. For a long while, the, 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 uh, this translation, Targum as it was called, was only oral. But after a while, people began writing them down. That's how we know it was, what was done. A few of these Targums have survived. And in the Targum of Jonathan, uh, William Barclay points out that the, this expression, the word, or the word of the Lord, occurred over 300 times as a periphrasis for God. So, we see that whether the original hearer was a Greek or a Jew or was influenced by either one of those, he would be used to thinking of the word as something or someone supremely important. The Greek would think of that rational principle that runs right through the universe. The Hebrew would think of that divine one whose name must not be spoken. But all alike would recognize in the expression the word something tremendously significant. So John could use this expression without explaining what he meant by it, knowing that whoever his readers were, they would read something very significant into what he was saying. Um, John thinks of the word as that one who came on earth to be with us, but he saves that up. One of the difficulties about expounding this chapter that we all know so well who is meant by the word when we're in verse 1, that we lose the impact. John doesn't identify the word with our Lord Jesus Christ till verse 14. And the first readers of this book would have had to go 13 verses not knowing that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Sometime you make the experiment of reading this chapter, putting out of your mind as far as you can the idea that the Word is our Lord Jesus Christ. Just think of it in terms of this Greek or Jewish approach. Some supremely great being or thing or something. It's not quite definite what it is, but it is supremely great and has been venerated through centuries, and this Logos makes sense. It was right in the beginning. 
right at the base of the universe. And the second thing he says is that the, the Logos was with God. He uses the preposition prostored, which most people agree should be translated with, but it may also have the idea of turning toward, there may be a little bit there of the idea that the Logos is not out of harmony with God the Father, but that the two are at one, they are turned toward one another. And he goes on to say, the word was God. A number of modern translations uh, render the word was divine, or something like that. Um, the English Bible, I think, has what God was, the word was. What the word was, God was, whichever way it puts it. I don't know that I object terribly much to those translations if they're taken with full seriousness. And if we take, for instance, that what God was, that, and nothing less, the word was. But if we are trying to, to cut this down to science a bit, and we don't want the thought that the word was, was divine, was God in the fullest sense, then I think these new translations are no improvement and in fact misinterpret the sense. They are saying how long us means the word was God. A lot of people um, make an argument from the fact that God here lacks the article and they suggest that this means that it's not the personal God that is meant, but that the term is used very much in the sense of an adjective and so we should translate the word with divine. Well, as I say, so long as it's taken with full seriousness and divine is given full meaning, I have no great quarrel with it. But as a piece of grammar, the reasoning is fallacious. Um, to put an article with God there would mean that God and the Logos, the Word, are identical, that there is no more to God than the Logos, the Word. Oh, that is a thing that no Christian wants to affirm. He believes that the Father is God and that the Spirit is God just as surely as he believes that the Son is God. So that the, uh, the article has to go out unless we're going to have a very funny idea of God indeed. It's also the case that uh, grammatically it has been shown, I'll give you the reference if you want it sometime, uh, that this... Uh, preceding predicate without the article has to be taken as definite, which uh, I suppose it sounds just a higher class piece of grammar it is too, but the effect of it is that grammatically this must be taken in the meaning the word was God. I would defend that as a piece of Greek grammar against every other translation. I say if you're interested in following that further, I should be happy to go into it, but let's not trouble this group with it. Okay, well that's the, uh, that's the way the first verse runs according to the, to the way it appears to me. And if I am to finish this by three, it looks like I'd better get through the next 17 a trifle more quickly. Uh, <laughs> oh, you just watch how I skate through too. This one was in the beginning with God. This says just the same as the first verse, so we needn't stop on it. Uh, this, well, the only thing that I want to add to that is that the repetition puts emphasis on it, and that's a device which John uses quite often. Uh, he is very fond of uh, repeating. Verse 3 introduces his uh, study of the way the, the word is related to creation. All things, he says, came into being through him, and I draw your attention to the preposition through. Most of our translations run, all things were made by him. That's not quite what John says. He's not saying that the Logos actually originated creation. 
he is saying that God created, not like the creed, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. John's not denying that. He's saying God the Father is the creator, but he created through the agency of the Logos, the Word. All things were made, came into being through him. And here we have another Johannine habit. He's very fond of saying the same thing, first positively and then negatively. And apart from him, there came into being not one thing that came into being. Uh, so that he's uh, now connecting the whole of creation with the activity of the Logos. Everything owes its origin to him. There's nothing of which it can be said this was independent of the Logos. Uh, is a trifle of a problem at the end of verse 3 and the beginning of verse 4, which arises from the fact that in the most ancient manuscripts there is practically no punctuation. All the punctuation that you see in the modern Greek text has come in from some learned editor who may or may not be right. Um, but in the early days, I didn't have punctuation, didn't believe in wasting space anyway, uh, to put it in. Now, in, the, in the time when the New Testament was written, papyrus was expensive, and you didn't waste it by leaving unnecessary spaces uh, so that as soon as you finished one word you started the other one and there was none of this um, space between the words as we have it now you take a, a gospel like John and the whole thing is just one great long word um, being a scribe was to be a member of a, of a skilled profession and you 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 have to look pretty hard at one of these old manuscripts before you can get the hang of it. After a while you can do it, but it's, uh, it's not obvious at all. But it means that uh, very often the scholars have delightful disputes as to where a sentence begins or ends, and so here. You could translate, all things came into being through him, and apart from him there came into being not one thing, full stop. What came into being was life in him, and the life was the light of men. Or, you can put that, uh, what came into being with verse 3, and make verse 4 read, in him was life. Now you have Theological fashion, as uh, Dr. Van Groningen has already reminded us, and the theological fashion these days is to take those words, what came into being, in with verse 4, and to put the full stop a little earlier. Here, I am going to, uh, to go against this modern fashion. I objection to, to modern fashions if they are well grounded, but I can't make sense of it. Now, apart from all things came to being of him, and apart from him they came into existence not one thing. Okay, suppose we do put the full stop there. What came into being was life in him? What the dickens does that mean? <laughs> Now you can write it down, and if it's a Greek or a writer, you can compare it to the Greek, yeah, that's a fine translation, but if instead of that you, you, you ask now, how am I to understand this? Then it's another problem. You could translate it, I suppose, what came into being in him was its life. But that is very clumsy, isn't it? Just as clumsy in Greek as it is in English. Uh, I find it difficult. Besides, I find it hard to fit into John. It's not a Johannine thought that everything that exists has life in it. It is a Johannine thought that everything that had life 
got it from the Logos. And the older translation preserves that. And I think the modern one does not. So I'm putting that's what came into being in verse four and I verse three, and I'm taking verse four to mean in him was light. And the light was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness. And the darkness didn't probably didn't overcome it. Uh, here we have a couple of important Johannine concepts, life and light. Um, they're simple words, aren't they? And John uses them both quite often. Indeed, somebody has said one of the Johannine habits is to take simple words, monosyllables, and run them right through his gospel in a bewildering variety of ways so that you wonder in the end how on earth you were ever such a fool as to think that they were simple. Uh, well, there's truth in that. It's unfortunate that if you stick it into the Greek life, is that there's a bisyllable word, not a monosyllable. It's so way. But um, light is a monosyllable. You get away with that one. Uh, <coughs> But certainly it is true that John takes these fundamental and basic words and he uses them over and over in a, as I say, in a bewildering variety of contexts. And you finish up realizing that these apparently simple concepts have tremendous depth in them. These two, both life and life he will later connect with the Lord Jesus Christ. He will tell us that Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He will tell us that Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So both of them, both light and life, are to be identified with the Lord Jesus Christ. Neither, in the Johannine sense, can be understood apart from that Lord Jesus Christ. Life that is real life and light which is genuine light are both known only because of Christ. Yeah. Jesus came, we read further over in the Gospel, that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. And that tremendous Abundant life, which John will also talk about as life eternal, is something which is connected with Jesus and which can be found nowhere else at all. And similarly, there were many who had tried to give light to mankind, but John sees them as nothing more than flickering will-o'-the-wisps. The true light, the light that matters, is the Logos, and there's no other than he. Notice in verse 5 that he says, and the light shines in the darkness. Present tense. Up till now, he's used the past consistently, and mostly he uses the past right the way through this prologue. But the present here draws attention to the continuing function of light. Light isn't something that shone some long time ago. It's still shining. And we still have the experience of that, that present shining of the light. And the darkness... Um, the translation here is a little awkward. Often people say the darkness did not understand it, did not comprehend it. Um, the word has the idea of, uh, of uh, holding a thing and holding it down. Now this is often used mentally, of, you know, of grasping a thing so that we've really got hold of it. And so it is a common word for understand, comprehend and the like. But it does seem as if the word is used now and then in the sense of overcome. And I think that's the way in which we should understand it here. There's no question of darkness trying to understand light. But there is question, the way John looks at it, of darkness and light 
as in conflict with one another. Um, the light and the darkness have no fellowship, no kinship. They are opposites. And what John is saying is that the darkness wasn't able to overcome the shining of the light. The light shines in the darkness. Precisely there. And that's the function of light, isn't it? We should bear that in mind because so often we are concerned with the darkness of this world and we long to get away from it. And to join as we do in an institute like this with God's own people. Oh, that's fine. I see no reason why this should not be done. But I see every reason why we should not see this as the be-all and the end-all of our Christian experience. It is the function of light to shine in the darkness. No point in light shining in the light. But there's every point in it shining in the darkness. Okay, there, that's two sections of our prologue. The Word and God, the Word and Creation. With verse 6, we have the third section, the word and John Baptist. Uh, there came into being a man sent from God. His name was John. This man came for witness, that he might bear witness about the light, so that all men might believe through him. He wasn't the light. But, uh, we have to supply a bit there, but came probably in order that he might bear witness about the light. Notice that this man was sent from God. And John Baptist's mission was not one that he worked out for himself. It was as a result of his divine commission. And having told us that he was sent from God, the name is given. His name was John. And it's important for us to reflect on that, too. It is still true that there is a man, a woman, sent from God. His name is John. Her name is Joan, whatever. And we are sent to do the work that God lays upon us in this place or in that. But unless we see ourselves as divinely commissioned, we miss out on the most important aspect of our service of God. This man came, we are told, for wit. so that he might bear witness about the light. Have you noticed that in this fourth gospel, that all that this man does, we call him John the Baptist. He didn't do any baptizing in this gospel. We are told that he was baptizing, but it's not recorded as it is in the first three that he baptized all sorts of people. If you want to find out what John the Baptist taught, you have to turn to Luke. John doesn't tell us. But he does tell us that John consistently bore witness. That's the only thing he did. And every time John Baptist turns up in this fourth gospel, he is bearing witness to Jesus. Man, that's something. There's a tremendous epithet of John way over in chapter 10, 11. John did no miracle, but all things that he spoke of Jesus were true. I like that to be able to be said about me. Now, in this world in which we find ourselves, people are demanding all kinds of miracles from us all the time. 
uh, we Christians is expected whatever particular piece of Christian organization we belong to should go faultlessly. Uh, it, it should be gathering momentum. It should be bigger, brighter, and better than it ever was in the past. There should never be any failures, and Christians should never fail if they do their act to have their, their shortcomings and blazons abroad. They're expected all the time to, to be perfect, to be miracle workers. It doesn't matter if we're not. But it does matter that we give a clear and faithful picture of Jesus. All things that he spoke of Jesus were true. So, this is all <clears throat> that the fourth evangelist is concerned to tell us about John. Always, John is bearing witness. And will you notice this? Witness commits so long as you don't bear witness, you retain all your options. You are standing on a corner, shall we say, and the two cars crash. And so long as you keep your big mouth shut, you've got all your options open. You can do what you want in the future. But the moment you bear your testimony, you are a committed person. And you say to the police officer, yes, I was there. I saw it. The man in the Ford was on the wrong side of the road and he went through a red light and hit the guy in the Chevy. Now, you can't afterwards say it was really all the fault of the guy in the Chevy without convicting yourself of being a liar. See, when you bear your witness, you commit yourself. John was a committed man. He bore his witness to Jesus. Matter of fact, one of the great thoughts in this gospel, which we won't be able to get onto because it's not in a prologue, and I just mention it in passing, is that <clears throat> there is an even greater thought here, namely that the Father bears witness to the Son. John wants us to see that God, so to speak, has committed himself. He has gone on record. He said, yes, look at my Son. And you'll see what I am like. He is committed to by his witness. For John the Baptist came for witness that he might bear witness about the light so that all might believe not in him but through him. He was to be the agent whereby people would come to faith. They would believe in Jesus Christ. He wasn't the light, it's repeated in verse 8, but came to bear witness about the light. John's habit of making the thing quite clear, he puts in this little addendum to, to clear it up. Evidently, there were some who were so enamored with John Baptist that they wouldn't leave him to go on to serve Christ. And he wants them to see that that is wrong. He, John wouldn't have wanted that. He wasn't the light, made no pretense of being it. <coughs> Then, from verse 9 down to verse 14, we have the word incarnate. 9 is a, a bit difficult to translate, but it's something like, that was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. The point is that coming probably goes with light and not with man. Some translations give the impression that the light which uh, that the light gives light to every man that comes into the world. I do not think this is the way it should be taken at all. Um, I don't think it's a Johannine thought that everybody who comes into the world has light. But what he's saying is that the light to whom John bore witness is the true light. And with that, he is saying, not only was he the true light, but he was coming into the world. 
any man who has light gets it from him. That's the point about the enlightened every man. But he's not saying that every man that comes into the world uh, was enlightened. So that light where men receive it comes from this logos. It was in the world, he says, and the world came into being through him, and the world <coughs> didn't know him. Notice John's way of getting at you with repetition. Three times he uses the word world in that, uh, that little verse. And a bit more time to spare, we could go into that, but I just draw your attention to it and press on. He came to his own, <coughs> he writes, and his own didn't receive him. You could translate that, he went home, and the home folk didn't welcome him. It's the same expression that you get later on in the gospel. Remember when Jesus was hanging on the cross? There at the foot of the cross were Mary and the beloved disciple. And he said, Woman, behold thy son. And he said, Son, behold thy mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her unto his own home. Same expression we have here. He went home. When I was a bit younger, kind of age that some of you people are, there was a, a gentleman called S.D. Gordon who was writing a lot of books. Um, he used to write books with titles, Choir Talks. Uh, choir Talks on Power, Choir Talks on Prayer, Choir Talks on Service. He spent a lot of time talking quietly, it would seem. His, his books sold in the millions. I mean, he's tremendous. And one of his books was Quiet Talks on John's Gospel. And I remember reading that particular one. I didn't read them all, but I read that one. And in it, <clears throat> as he comes to this verse, he says he'll use a little illustration. Here is a business man, he says, he's spent all day working in the office and He's pretty tired, and he's coming home. And this is a, this is a businessman who uses the train to uh, to travel to and fro. And he gets off at his station, and he walks home. And as he turns the corner to come up to where his house is, he step quickens a little. And it's been a tough day, but he's near to his home folk. It will be great to get there. And so he, he, he comes up through his gate up to his front porch and he feels in his pocket for his key. It isn't there. He's misplaced it somewhere. It doesn't matter. They're home and he knocks on the door. He knows they're there because the curtain is pulled back a little and those eyes that he knows so well look out at him and see him standing there on the porch. And they keep him standing there. They won't open the door. Ridiculous, says Gordon. Do you say that is a very poor illustration? It couldn't have happened. No, it couldn't have happened. And yet, it did happen to him. He went home. And his very own home folk didn't receive him. They kept him outside. That's the heartbreak behind this gospel. John 
is writing about one that meant more than life to him. And he has to say that when he went home, the home folk didn't receive him. Wouldn't have been so bad, John might have said, if he'd gone to the Romans or the Gauls or the Greeks or someone. But he didn't. He went home. He went to God's own people. His own folk didn't let him in. Well, I leave you to work out the application of that to God's own church in these days because it is still sometimes the case that he comes home and his own folk don't give him a welcome. John won't leave us with the impression that that's the whole story. So in verse 12, he tells us, but as many as received him, he gave to them authority to become God's children, to those who believe on his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So that there were those who received him, and they became God's children. It's often translated that he gave them power to become children of God. The word isn't power, it's authority. He gave them the right to membership in the family of God. One of the great New Testament ideas that we don't really belong because of our sin. We've gotten off into some other place. But God adopts sinners into his own family. And so we come to belong there. We, we have the, the right to become children of God. One little point about John's approach is that <clears throat> he always uses this word children when he's talking about, about men and women. He never uses the expression sons when he uses the word we are son. He's referring to Jesus himself. Uh, this is not a usage that runs right through the old, uh, through the whole New Testament. Other writers cheerfully use we are of our sonship to God. But John puts this little difference. It's part of the way in which he brings out the truth that while we are admitted into the heavenly family, we ought not to think that our membership is on a level with his. He is... Uh, he is different and a closer relationship to God. Uh, he is the Son in a way we never can be. But we have authority to belong to God's family, and that's the important thing. Um, and this is something that comes about not by any merit of our own, but because we believe on his name. Uh, believing is one of the great ideas in this fourth gospel. John uses the verb to believe 98 times. One of the minor mysteries of the New Testament is why, using the verb 98 times, he never uses the noun at all. We must turn to some other book to read about faith. But there is just not one mention of it in the fourth gospel from start to finish. However, I have enough problems with what is here without turning aside to what isn't. And he concentrates then on those who believe on his name. The name, of course, in antiquity meant a good deal more than it does with us. With us, a name is little more than a, a label, a distinguishing mark, so that we can tell one from another. And we always have a problem when we have two or three guys with the same name. We usually solve it by giving one or other of them a nickname, and so we, we finish up somehow with, with different names. But in antiquity, it wasn't like that. Uh, they didn't think of the name as being 
matter indifferent. For that matter, a lot of other people haven't. Um, when I was a small boy, I used to read wonderful stories about the Red Indians of this country, and I read that they had uh, names like Hawkeye and Deerfoot, Singing Bull, and so on. I didn't know then, but I have since discovered that they did that because the names mattered. Oh, when an Indian brave gave his little boy the name Deerfoot, he couldn't have explained how, but somehow he thought that the, the name and the quality went together. A little guy would run just that bit faster because he had the name Deerfoot. And the little, little fellow would see just that bit better because he had the name Hawkeye. To this day, I'm not quite certain what he had in mind when he called him Sitting Bull, but... <laughs> but I have no doubt that there was some great and profound meaning in that, too. Now, I am not saying that in the New Testament the name was used in the same way it was with the Red Indians. I don't think it was. I'm simply drawing your attention to the fact that we ought not complacently to assume that the way we use names is the only way. It isn't. And lots of people have used names in a different way from the way that we take for granted. And in, in the first century, the name and the character went together. Now, there's a, an interesting bit in Revelation where there's a reference to him that overcometh. To him that overcometh will I give a white stone, and on the stone a new name written, which nobody knows except he that receives it. The way we use the word name, that's plumb crazy. The sense of the name is nobody knows it. Nobody can possibly use it. But in the first century, this is very important. The name represents the character and what John is saying over in Revelation is that when a man overcomes, God gives to him a new character. Not something that goes out to everybody. It's a little secret between him and God. And it's expressed in this new name which nobody knows. Well, this is the sort of thing that we have. Believing in the name doesn't mean simply standing up and saying, I believe in Jesus Christ. It means from the heart accepting all that Jesus is and does. The name stands for the whole character. It brings before us the thought of him who left his throne in glory and lived on earth despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, brings before us the thought that one day he died on Calvary's cross to put away our sin. There's a way of saying that that crucified Lord is the one way of life for mankind. And so those who believe on his name have recognized him for what he is and they've put their trust in him for now and for eternity. Those who believe on his name. They were born, John goes on, not of blood. Actually, he says not of blood. Plural, I don't know why, but there it is, it's a plural nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of a man, but of God. And I think that he's saying here that there is no evolution 
from man's sinful state to being a member of God's family. Um, the same S.D. Gordon in his quiet talk I recall <coughs> mentions that you can do a lot of things with a potato. Uh, you can get your scientists to work on it so that you can get a bigger, brighter and better potato. You can breed it so that it comes in early or comes in late. You can breed it so you're going to get a lot of little potatoes or just one great big one. Uh, you can alter the configuration of the potato in many ways. But what you can't do is get Bartlett pears from it. Uh, do what you will. To the end, it remains a humble Murphy. Now, what John is saying is that you can take the natural man and brush him up any way you will. He still doesn't become a child of God. That is not something that is brought about by any human endeavor. If it comes at all, it comes as God's good gift. And then the climax of it in verse 14, And the Word became flesh, pitched his tent among us, and we saw his glory, glory like that of an only son from a father, full of grace and truth. The word became flesh is a strong, almost a crude expression. John doesn't say the word became human or the word became man. Um, not quite as crude as saying became meat, but flesh is used for the, the soft parts of the body. What he's doing is, is getting rid of highfalutin, quote, spiritual, unquote, notions of what the incarnation meant. He's saying he came right where we are. He took on him a literal, physical body. And that is something that neither Jew nor Greek could have associated with the Logos. This is the, the tremendous climax to what John is saying, and it is that which um, others couldn't have said. The Word became flesh, and he, he lived among us. Some people put emphasis on this tabernacle, but I don't think it's a tabernacle in the sense of temporary dwelling. It's tabernacle that, in the sense that it draws attention to the tabernacle in the wilderness where God's blessing was and God's glory was. What he's saying is that when he came right where we are, the glory of God was with him. We saw his glory. Glory like that of an only one from the Father, and he was full of grace and truth. And he rounds off this prologue in verses 15 to 18 by drawing attention to the word surpassing excellence. John bears witness about him, he says, and he has cried out saying, This was he of whom I spoke. He who comes after me has become before me, because he was before me. And out of his fullness did we all receive, and grace upon grace. The law was given through Moses, grace and truth through Jesus Christ. Nobody ever saw God, the only God who was in the bosom of the Father, that one set him forth. There was an idea in the first century that uh, the, the earlier is the greater. Uh, it's incredible to the young of this generation, but in that generation, young men really thought that their fathers were wiser than they. Um, and it was accepted as an axiom that if you came late, 
you were not as great as the former one. There were giants in the land in those days. And the good old days was not just a line that produces a laugh as so often with us, but something people took quite seriously. The really great people lived earlier. And so it was a problem to some people that Jesus should be greater than John Baptist when Jesus came after John Baptist. But John Baptist clears it up. He says he really was before me. His basic existence was before mine. And so he has come to be before me. And uh, the, the contrast between the law that uh, came through Moses, that uh, was given through Moses, grace and truth, which came through Jesus Christ. Grace and truth, I think, are pictured a little dynamically here as coming through Jesus Christ. And then the prologue finishes with that tremendous thought that nobody's ever known God, nobody's ever seen God. The way in which we know him is because the Logos, the Word, set him forth. Exegesera. The Word is his exegesis. In other words, we know God because Christ has revealed him. We know him in no other way. Oh, that's the way the gospel is introduced. And as we read through that prologue, we get most of the great thoughts which are going to be expounded as this gospel unfolds. We have here the what it's all about and a, a very succinct summary of much of the important truth of the Christian faith. Let's finish up. We started with prayer. Let's pray.